hopefully we're gonna be doing some quick videos today <clears throat> not like I have a lot of stuff to do or anything but uh, it's it's hard to deny that this deck is great at this point right Tom Ross just won back-to-back -back opens and yeah I made back-to-back -back top eights that's not bad but I didn't win both tournaments and that is pretty insane so <clears throat> Uh, I spent a lot of time with Tom Ross over the last couple weeks, uh, just going to these tournaments together and stuff, and I think I've learned a lot about this deck, and uh, he has too, actually, you know, like, one of the main things I think that has happened over the last few months is that Tom has been, like, tightening up his uh, hand selection as far as, like, which hands he'll mulligan, and it used to just be, like, any one lander with multiple one drops he would keep, but now it's, like, he's under a, a more strict... Uh, form of guideline where it's got got to have like two one drops, two Thalia's lieutenants, uh, you know, something along those lines. Like you, you have to have a hand where uh, if you don't hit your second land immediately, and like there, there are only 18 lands in this deck, you know, there are not a ton of lands. Uh, if you don't hit your land immediately, like you do have enough powerful ways to actually make it. So if you skip a turn or so, like you still have a lot of ways to actually force action and put pressure on your opponent and... Uh, if your opponent ends up like kind of stabilizing, you know, you have some good ways to push through, which the Thalia's lieutenants actually do. But uh, yeah, so little things like that, that uh, just kind of like add up over the course of a tournament and uh, just make it so that, you know, you're not giving away a lot of free games and stuff, you know? Like I, I think that was one of the things that Tom was doing before where it seemed fine at the time, but compared to especially like a mulligan to six plus a scry, like... You don't necessarily need, you know, seven cards in your opening hand or, like, 12 cards over the course of a game or whatever. Maybe you only need 10 or so. So, you know, like, he has he has a lot of leeway there as far as, like, which hands he can and can't keep. And through playing the deck and playing the format and stuff, uh, that that has kind of just, like, evolved and become a more streamlined, good strategy for him. And he's just capitalized on that. He won the last two tournaments, which is just insane. So we're going to be playing with this deck. Uh, basically, white weenie deck, but uh, a little human theme with the Thalia's lieutenants. Uh, this deck has like the best tiny white creatures in the format, and then things like Griff Spoon, uh, Thalia's lieutenants, and always watching to basically, you know, make your things a little bit bigger. In the case of Griff Spoon, gives you a little bit of evasion and some staying power too, which is pretty nice. Uh, and then four Declaration in Stone, which is just the most efficient removal spell for clearing blockers and. Uh, a lot of the time, you're not you're you're going to be like invalidating their creatures a lot, not necessarily killing their stuff, but then sometimes there's something like a lame old pacifist or whatever, where it's just like a little inconvenient to actually like attack through. So you actually want some declarations to help clear the way. But the other thing that helps against blockers is just having something like anointer champions, and especially this card with always watching is very potent. Uh, basically, it just means that like their sylvan advocates and other things that they would use to brick wall your two ones just no longer matter, and you also get to attack with the anointer and and still use its ability and stuff. So Vigilance is really good with this card. Uh, Tom went up to a third copy this week, which I think was really good because uh, there are a lot of green-white tokens decks, a lot of mirror matches, uh, basically just a lot of creature combat happening right now. So Anointer's great. Uh, Town Gossip Monger is probably the most impressive creature in the deck just because it's so big. It's basically just a 2-3 for one mana because it's not very difficult to transform. Uh, there's also the combo with Always Watching, where you can play it next turn, attack with your stuff, still transform it, which is pretty sweet. Uh, and if you have, like, another a, a way to pump it, you know, again, it, like, gets through Sylvan Advocate, Pacifist, like, very, very easily. Uh, so, yeah, this card is, is just kind of busted, and if you get a counter on this, you're getting Always Watching, it lives through Radiant Flames. If you get two counters, then it lives through Languish, you know. And basically, you just kind of, like, put the chokehold on your opponent, like, cut off their outs if possible, uh, if they do have outs like language and stuff, you know, there there are definitely games where you try and play around it because you feel like you can. And even if, like if they do have it, they have to use it and then you just get to rebuild. Uh, but there are certainly some games where you just like can't beat the sweeper if they have it. You just have to like jam all your stuff and hope they don't have it, you know. Uh, so there is a lot of play to this deck actually. A lot of creature combat. So if you end up playing a lot of mirror matches, then uh, that is definitely something that you need to be used to. So, you know, practice. Play some limited. Get used to... To play with creatures and bouncing them off each other. Uh, and then the other big change, I guess, is this Handwear Militia Captain in the main deck over Consul's Lieutenant. And I was unsure of this one because uh, Tom kept talking about how, you know, he had this card in the sideboard for 
matchups where they didn't necessarily have a lot of removal, but they did have a lot of creatures on the board. Uh, so something like uh, the Mirror Match or any of the various band company forms, stuff like that, where uh, you might want to bring this in and just like, you know, make a 4-4, four, 5-5, four, five, five, whatever, and like slowly build your board and stuff, or at least just like have one big attacker, maybe you put a Griff Spoon on this or something. And he he was just saying that he like never transformed it, it never seemed like it did a bunch of work, but uh, I, I feel like you play this card and it changes the way they have to play. Like maybe they want to sandbag their Jamoka's Command, wait for you're always watching, but now they have to use it to make sure that this thing doesn't transform because otherwise this thing's going to beat them. So it, it might not ever like transform and then run away with the game, but at the same time it does change the way that they have to play. And at the very least, uh, this card is replacing Consul's Lieutenant, which is also like kind of good in those matchups for the same reason, just because it has first strike, but uh, this card is basically like a better version of, of that effect. You know, if you're going to play a, an additional two mana creature because it's good against decks that get on the battlefield, then I think this is probably an upgrade to Consul's Lieutenant, and I do like that a lot. It also frees up sideboard space. And the sideboard is, is kind of spicy. So main deck has some battlefield forges, no red cards in the main deck. Uh, we've seen some red-white human decks that have things like Outnumber, Abbot of Carol Keep, Reckless Bushwhacker main deck. And those things are fine, but like the mana is just not good. It's like kind of atrocious. You know, if we had something like a mana confluence or uh, a, a red white scars land or something of that nature, it might be a little bit better. But since you have to play needle spires and a couple mountains, it kind of screws everything up. You don't have Knight of the White Orchid to fix for red mana because you don't have like a canopy vista, a battle land to fetch with that thing. So the red mana is tough. So you play the four forges main deck, which is generally not that big of a deal. Like you are typically the person putting pressure on your opponent and Games very rarely devolve into very tight races where the damage actually matters. Uh, there, there are certainly some instances where that does come up, but I feel like most of the time you're you're winning the game or uh, your opponent manages to stabilize, and the fact that you know you took some extra damage from your battlefield forges is really not going to affect whether or not you you are going to win or lose the game because you probably already lost if they've managed to stabilize. So, battlefield forge in the main deck kind of a free roll. Uh, sideboard has four reckless bushwhackers along with four needle spires in these. Just kind of put pressure on the control decks. Like, the mono white deck was a, a very, very good, like, level one strategy. It was, it's just like the best version of, of what this deck can try and do. But at the same time, it's very narrow. You know, if you do run up, run up against a bunch of Radiant Flames and Languishes and whatnot, uh, it can be actually tough to come back from that. And you could play things like Gideon and Secure the Waste, and this deck is still doing that. But you have, you also, like, don't maximize your sideboard slots all that much. You know, you have. Like, some small upgrades here and there, like, maybe some Stasis Snares for some Avacins and, like, other bigger creatures. Maybe, like, Silk Wrap for the Mirror, Fourth Griff Spoon against Band, stuff like that. But it's, like, you really don't have a lot of great cards that you want to put in your 15. So you have a lot of leeway for how you want to try and fight these tough matchups, which are the ones with Sweepers. So uh, you have Needle Spires, which definitely just pressures them. Like, if they have a Sweeper and you have something like an Always Watching and they languish you and then you're just like, all right, take six. You know, and then they need an answer to this Needle Spires. Ultimate Price doesn't do it. They basically need Grasp of Darkness, and uh, that card's tough to cast, and it's not, uh, you know, it's not an automatic four of in a lot of decks. So, like, Needle Spires is actually very difficult to deal with. Uh, and there's also the scenario where you play out enough things to get them to languish, and then you get to play, like, Creature, Creature, Bushwhacker, or sometimes even, like, Creature plus Bushwhacker is good enough. So, uh, you're basically splashing red to fight these Sweepers, which I think is really good, is very clever, uh, I was playing blue for, like, Reflector Mages and, like, some Negates and stuff, but, like, the the mana was, uh, it was, it was good at times, you know, you can certainly have, like, Port Town into, like, Basic, into, like, Knight of the White Orchid, get another Basic, play my Prairie Stream, but then sometimes you just have a bunch of lands that ETP tapped, and, uh, your draws just kind of fall apart from there, and this deck, since it doesn't use its sideboard, basically just gets to play all of the anti-control stuff in the sideboard, which I really like. And then you don't really have to sacrifice anything with your mana base all that much. So, uh, I like the Bushwhackers a lot. Uh, Tom, I believe, finished off Game 3 by casting a Reckless Bushwhacker. And, yeah, the card the card has proven to be pretty good for him. Uh, he has liked the Red Splash so far. Uh, one of the things that we try to do this week is uh, combine Secure the Waste with Bushwhacker, just because it, it felt like... Uh, Bushwhacker might come up a little bit short at times, just because you generally have to commit a decent amount to the board. They'll use like a spot removal spell on one of your creatures, and then you have to commit like a little bit more to get them to languish, and then you're you're really not left with a lot 
in the tank uh, as far as to, to bushwhack with. So I felt like a secure the waste for three untap. You play like a creature in a bushwhacker is like going to be like 10 damage. It's, it should be enough to kill them, you know. Uh, but Tom, <laughs> over the course of the tournament, Tom cast secure the waste twice and lost both of those games. Uh, I don't necessarily think that's an indicator of how poorly the card is or like how poorly it's positioned. Uh, I do want to continue trying it because I, I feel like, you know, it warrants more testing. You know, that's a pretty small sample size, just two games. And I do feel like the ceiling is pretty high on Secure the Waste, especially once you have Gideon also. But uh, some of these lists have Gideon and Bushwhacker in their sideboard just to have like a high density of cards that are good against control, which is understandable. But at the same time, Gideon and Bushwhacker don't really combo all that well together because Bushwhacker wants you to have this high density of one-drop creatures and... You know, Gideon doesn't really care. Like, Gideon is just good on its own. But at the same time, Gideon and Bushwhacker don't really mix. So I didn't want a, a large amount of both of them because I felt like there was a bunch of dissynergy there. So uh, I advocated for one Secure the Waste. Maybe, like, two, actually. But uh, Tom went with one. He was not happy with it. But, you know, we'll see what happens going forward. We'll see how it performs for me. And then, yeah, a couple Stasis Snares, Silk Wrap, Grist Boon. Uh, overall, pretty simple. It is basically just, like, smash them in game one just because... People do not have enough removal in their main decks to deal with a deck like this, and I don't think that there needs to be a knee-jerk reaction where, you know, you end up playing, like, more sweepers or, like, deadweights main deck, or, you know, you go from, like, eight removal spells to 12 or something like that. Even, it doesn't necessarily solve the issue. Like, really what you need is sweepers plus, like, some brick walls, like Pacifist, Sylvan Advocate, like, those cards are really good. And uh, to just have, like, a, a pretty low mana curve, you know? Just be able to, like, stay toe-to-toe -to -toe with them with what's going on on the battlefield. Uh, so that's one of the issues with green-white tokens. You have things like Avacyn and Gideon, which are not particularly well-positioned against this deck. So, yeah. Uh, going forward, I'm not sure what people have to do necessarily to adapt to this deck, but it is definitely real. It is here to stay. Uh, Tom won the Open in Atlanta the... The next open was in Orlando, and there were three copies of this deck in the top eight, including uh, Charles Gindy, who Tom worked with leading up to the event, and I believe they played the same 75. So, yeah, the deck is is performing quite well, and uh, it, it is quite good against green-white tokens, despite Tom continuing to lose to that deck uh, against players that are not me, at least. He beats me, but loses to everyone else, I guess. So, I don't know. Uh, I do feel like this deck is pretty good against green-white. It is rough against decks like the Naya mid-range deck that made the finals with the main deck Radiant Flames, but uh, Tom was having pretty good success against Black-White and, you know, things like Hoogland's Abzan deck and stuff like that, just because, like, language is a little bit slower and uh, just Radiant Flames being one mana cheaper is, is just so much better. So uh, going forward to this weekend, uh, either in SCG, or not SCG, uh, GB Pittsburgh and the SCG Classic in Dallas, uh, I would expect there to be more Radiant Flames, but Red is not that great in this format, so it's tough. You can't just, like, jam Red and Radiant Flames in any deck and, like, you know, try and hate this deck out or whatever. It's probably just not going to work. But, yeah, maybe just uh, keep in mind that this deck exists. It is very good and lower your mana curve a little bit. But uh, I'm going to try and beat some people, get some quick tickets, and just try and get Moto Rich, recoup the cost for buying these 15-ticket Kithians. But let's get to it.